Hello, and welcome to Smart Talk, powered by GenieCast, with support from the Nitrous Effect and the Emerson Leadership Institute in the Shape It School of Business at St. Louis University. My name is John Lanius. I am the Chief Operating Officer here at GenieCast, and happy that you're here. And today, our Smart Talk is entitled Sustainability from Farm to Table with Tony Pardo of AgriAuthority. Tony, welcome to Smart Talks, powered by GenieCast. How are you? Oh, you're on mute. Hang on. I th we will get you there. Good, there good go. afternoon, John. It's after lunch. It's sorry about that, buddy. It's after lunch. So no, I love it. I love it. Thank, All right. Thank, well, you. thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, well, great for being here. So, you know, when I was looking at your bio, I was like, you know, there's a lot here. And, you know, instead of reading it, what, what I was thinking about was actually discussing it because when you think about how you know you started on a small cattle ranch in South Texas, let's talk a little bit about how those seminal experiences would lead to where you are today. Well, thank you, John. Again, and and my apologies for for the mute button there at the initial start. But um, so yes, I grew up in in Texas, small little um, uh, Santa Gertrudis ranch. Uh, probably not a lot of people on online would be familiar with that. It's a, a very hardy. Uh, uh, breed of cattle in, in South Texas uh, that's been bred for heat tolerant and, uh, and lean meat. Uh, so grew up there, uh, heavily involved in 4-H um, in growing up. I was also um, very, very um, in, involved in, in livestock showing, I, I should say, you know, participated in quite a few uh, livestock shows uh, growing up where, you know, I, would uh, I'd feed out my my swine, my pigs. I'd feed out my lambs and my beef cattle, and then uh, take it to the local county fair and uh, see what see what it would do for me. And I have to tell you, John, and I'd, I'll share a little story with you that uh, I had a reserve grand champion pig at the ha at the San Antonio Livestock Show, and that paid for my first year of college. Nice. Oh, that's great. Well, I mean, so so just that little bit of introduction when you talk about sustainability from the farm to the table. I mean. No one can say that you haven't had this in your DNA since, since the beginning. Am I right? That is correct. And I, th I think also on that farm, one of the interesting things, John, is that, you know, it was it was a lot of time was spent around my grandfather uh, and, and his operation. And uh, I'll have to I'll share another story. Um, you know, he was always overseeding uh, and he would always tell me the story about having to plant four seeds one for the bird, mm -hmm. one for disease, one for insect, and one to grow on. Mm -hmm. And back then, you know, we didn't have the the innovation, the tech the, or the technology that we have today, yeah. and the innovation that we have today. So he was basically overseeding, trying to make sure that he at least he had one of those seeds that that, that actually uh, grew or germinated and, and had a crop that year. And as we look at uh, at, at uh, technology today through sustainability, a, a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, our seed varieties have changed to be able to be more tolerant uh, to heat and to stress. Uh, we have better, you know, pesticides, synthetic pesticides that allow us to protect against some of these insects. You know, we have the same for fungicides. Plus, there's a lot of new technology in the age of sustainability that's also in the bio side that's that's replacing some of these or accompanying some of these some of these products to date. So, you know, that's all part of sustainable. What he was doing wasn't very sustainable at that time. You know, it goes back to the old thing that we see in picture shows and still still in third world countries. We still see the ox with, you know, with the uh, with the plow and the guy behind it, you know, not very not sustainable at all. Cannot do that to feed the world uh, that, that uh, we're living in today. So what I really enjoy about the story when you're talking about overseeding, um, you may know that the word broadcasting comes from actually farm and, and, and spreading seeds, right? So right. today we're broadcasting in, in many ways, the message of you and agri-authority and, and also really sustainability, you know, from farm to table. And so before we step into some of the specific questions that we're going to cover over the next hour, will you talk a little bit about some of the other leadership roles so that the audience really has an, has an understanding of the breadth of your background? Sure. Um, so I, I uh, was, as I said, born, educated, raised in Texas. Um, I started my career as an assistant county agent, uh, which is 
most of the states not as not as uh, as prominent today as they were in the past when I was when I was first started. Um, it's part of the university system, and uh, so I was an assistant county agent uh, for about two years. Uh, after that time, I took on a a role with a seed treatment company. Um, and that also yeah, there's a, there's a sustainability story behind that. As I first started my career, um, from there I moved into um, a general manager's position in the country of Mexico. Very different type of agricultural practices from one country to the other. And then after that, I returned back to the U.S. in about the mid uh, about 2005, and I took on a leadership role as a district sales manager. Uh, for a basic manufacturer, basic chemical company here, here in the, uh, in the, I'm located in Kansas, so in for Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, in the Panhandle of, uh, of Nebraska. I then left that basic five company and went into the food service business. So really got to see the aspects from agriculture, then into food service. It was more on the commodity side of the business, really versus the, the food and and. Um, uh, the food side. So I really serviced a lot of hotels on an international basis and restaurants. And then um, uh, my career uh, brought me to AgriAuthority to where I currently so serve as a, uh, a global director for client services. So uh, it's been a, uh, it's been a good career. It's been a blessed career and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here at AgriAuthority. So. Well, I, so here, here's what I love about your introduction. If, if anyone doubts that you have global experience in that title, then they're not paying attention. <laughs> so, so this is really perfect. So you know, kind of looking at the next hour, for, for those of you who have just joined us, um, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions toward the end of the hour. Uh, you can do that over, uh, over the chat. Uh, you, you, you also can raise your hand if you'd like and, and ask a question directly. Sometimes people are like, oh, wait, I'm gonna be on camera. Yes, you might be on camera if you wanna be, but if not, you, we will safely ask the questions uh, over Zoom. Uh, but until then, uh, it'll be Tony and I you know, going back and forth and, and, and really presencing this whole sustainability from, from the farm to the table. So. So, Tony, from, from your perspective, um, what is sustainability from your agricultural background? Okay. Um, so, John, let me start by saying, and I mentioned it earlier in my introduction when you're asking me about my career in, in the early 80s, you know, sustainability has been around globally and U.S. wide for many years, the word has. And this gave me an opportunity to, to, to go back and look. In, in just to share a fact here, in 1907, an American author by the name of Franklin King, he discussed in his book called Farmers of 40 Centuries, mm -hmm. the advantages of sustainable agriculture and wanted that, and, and mentioned that such practices would be vital to farming in the future. So here we are today, from 1907, here we are today talking just about every day about sustainability. Also, in, 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 even though it started in 07, really when you look at literature, when you look at, at, at history, it, it really started in the late 18, about 1980, I'm sorry, eight, about 1980 is when it really became popular. And that's about the time that I entered into the seed treatment business. So being in the seed treatment business was kind of interesting because when we first started selling seed treatments, now these are the fungicides and insecticides that go on on, on seed, we started off, I, re I recall, we started off with metal containers, just metal drums. You know, you see them on the side of the road, the 55 gallon drums that you could buy and they're just metal drums. It didn't, it wasn't a transition, but about two years later, three years later, that we went to returnable drums, part of sustainability. Then after that, one short after that, we went to returnable drums. Um, so, you know, you, you can now return them to us, we would refill them and take them back in. So all part of sustainability. Today, when I, when I actually, uh, still in 05, it, I mean, excuse me, still in 2015, now you're using products that are direct injection onto the seed. So you've really minimized, Te technology has allowed us to be more innovative, to be able to be more sustainable uh, as we move forward. 
so that was just I wanted to bring that up because I know that that's kind of in in 1980s kind of late 1980s is kind of when that started really kind of when I started in 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 the uh, in the crop protection business so so another thing that that I'd like to mention is is on my perspective of sustainably it's about environment friendly methods of farming uh, that allow crop and livestock production to produce high quality and an affordable abundance of healthy food to feed and and this we have to Keep in mind, because we'll hear it a lot throughout the day, a global growing population. And we, it continues to grow. We, we continue to build and rule in, in uh, urban areas. That takes away from our ag production acres. Okay. So while the U.S. also, and I, I, I kind of found this, is the, is the U.S. has a, they have a sustainable, they have kind of have like three tiers or three tiers that they call for sustainability, environment, social, and economic. Here at Ag Authority, we believe that sustainability is basically three things. It's practical, productive, and profitable. If we have that system, then you know it, it, it we here at Ag Authority and myself, I believe that we work a lot on the practical and the productive. That's kind of where we dedicate our time and our efforts in that. We increase in, um, at, at Ag Authority, we'll help you increase in development, development projects. We've increased our development projects, I should say, in carbon sequestration, in corn and in soybeans, uh, which is going to continue to be more important. You know, we hear it more in the news, continue to be more important on a day to day basis. Also, the complexity and, and variability of you know, growing plants and animals or animals that feed, clothe, and fuel the population is also a basis of our product and what we do today. Um, as we look at the at at the at the three pillars that I was talking about, um, uh, John, it's the profitability is one of those that is very key, I think, to the grower. Um, he he practices. He's always been practicing sustainability. It, it's a, it's in his DNA. As you mentioned DNA earlier, that's what he's done. Doing it without even knowing that he's doing it, and it's all for one goal. And I think that is to to build a safe environment, to feed our our, our growing population, and to clothe our growing po our, our our growing population. Mm -hmm. So it's it's you can I see it as as something that's continual, it, it it's always ongoing, and we're always doing something. So I appreciate that you included a lot of the history because I think when you hear the word sustainability, I think some people think, oh, it just showed up, like you know, ten years ago. And when in actuality, it's it's been around, you know, for for quite some time. And I'm I'm also thinking about conservation. You know, for those who don't, I I live rurally, and so you know, I'm I'm more present. To the kinds of conversations that relate to sustainability and conservation. Uh, I'm curious, and from, from your perspective, how does conservation connect to sustainability and, and how does that further your goals where you currently are? It, 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 yes, so I, it made me think when you said conservation, it made me think of CPR land Mm -hmm. um, back in, you know, the time when I started and, you know, a lot of sustainability at that time was integrated pest management, you know, finding where your pests are applying there. Today we have best management practices and, and you know, growers always use best, best management practices and continues to. So conservation, you know, land conservation, it, 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 it avoids erosion. You know, it allows you to rotate even on a livestock farm from rotating from one field to the other. You know, conserving that land, conserving that soil. You know, anytime, I, I, you know, a, a grower is very cautious of trying to, to, to put back into the soil what he took out of it, mm -hmm. uh, whether that is through uh, synthetic, because that's what's there, or even through some of the new technology, innovative technology that's coming out today. But conservation and, and it's not only conservation in agriculture i mean it's conservation of you know our waters and, and our parks and you know all around us and, and um you know this is 
sustainability, and I'll probably say it again, sustainability, it's a team effort. Mm -hmm. It's the grower and the consumer. But uh, yeah, conservation, land conservation, soil erosion, you know, back several years ago, or as I was growing up, you know, um, uh, irrigating through through flooding, you know, just just opening up, putting pipes out, laying pipes out, letting that water run through the roads so it would get irrigated, you know, just eroding the soil. Today, there's just high tech, you know, some of us have probably seen them, uh, you know, uh, center, center pivots that are that are actually uh, applying directly, you know, irrigating directly on the planter at that soil, eliminating soil erosion. And, and since we're talking about definitions or different interpretations, what are some of the misconceptions that you think would be important to share early in the conversation about what sustainability actually is? It's it, it, it's it's not just a word. Um, it is it is being able to effectively and correctly, efficiently being able to feed the world and clothe the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're doing it, whether we're on the farm, whether we're in the city, whether we're wherever we may be globally. Um, it, it is, it's something that, that, that we're all doing and we're all contributing to. Um, to give you an example, um, I, it just so happened that maybe two days ago, I was thumbing through the internet and saw that, that some of, um, uh, there was a, um, a particular global company, uh, Italian designer, that had a whole sustainability website on his, on, 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 on his site, it linked onto his website. And it was all about su sustainability and, and how he was using you know, sustainable cotton, you know, building uh, materials out of, re you know, recycled plastic or, you know, to take it back to agriculture, you know, some of the pallets, you know, as, as we were in the ag chem business, some of the pallets that we were using uh, were recyclable uh, plastic instead of wood. So again, goes back to the tree, less wood, and taking some of that plastic and recyclabling, recyclabling, recyclabling um, to make pallets. Got it. Well, so I think I think we've done a good job of kind of talking about the misconceptions, talking about what it means, you know, for the growers, i.e., the farmers, um, and and also you know, kind of the kind of the perceptions for the general public. So, what I'd like to do is is, is move on to talk a little bit about the the, the potential impact on food supply, to your point, talking about how the population continues to grow, you know, how is this impacting ultimately, you know, or, or potentially the, our food supply and for, you know, for really making sure the human beings continue on? It, 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 it affects it in the, in the fact that if we do not have the tools in place um, to actually produce high quality, high volume, or, or, or high yielding crops, then it just, it, it doesn't only affect us on the farm, it, it affects the consumer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot that drives high yield. There's a lot that drives high quality and you just have to have the, the good technologies, the innovative technologies, you know, farmers have to stay on top of the, the ever changing technologies that are available. He, he, they're learning more and more every single day. And, you know, one of the things is that it, because we were on definitions earlier, you know, one thing I didn't mention, I mean, sustainability is also, it, it, it's, it's, um, uh, it's generational. Um, so, you know, farmers back in the, let's just say early 60s to give it a year, are not as aware of sustainability as farmers today that are younger, that are more, you know, that have digital, that have uh, uh, precision ag, uh, that have a lot of digital farming going on. Um, so it, it, 
it does the grower has to be on top of a lot of these things to be able to produce high quality food that we put on the table. And, and again, it, it, it becomes critical for both parties. It becomes critical for the farmer and it becomes critical for the consumer that, that we make sure that, that, that not only we, uh, um, uh, that, that we understand sustainability in its full. Got it. And so this that had me start thinking about, so when we're talking about CPR and we're talking about, you know, different types of land and how they're managed, et cetera, obviously sustainability is something that we are managing not only as the farmer, but also, you know, in different environments as well. How does sustainability impact food waste and does it contribute to it or, or does it help it? Well, more production, uh, growing population, um, you know, you need the food. Mm -hmm. One of the factors, and I don't remember the stat, John, but food waste is, is an issue in sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, an excess of food waste is not good for the environment, not good for, uh, you know, the, the consumer. It's not good for anyone. Or it's, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. But we also need to understand how to properly dispose of that and what to do with, with some of that, your food banks and some of that, you know, some of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the consumers do not realize that food waste is, 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 uh, is not sustainable. That's why I think some of the technology today in, in being able to, to harvest and select good quality grades of, of, of prime vegetables or fruits and things like that is, is very, very important. Um, also, you know, your growers have to be uh, have to be well educated on when to exactly harvest to be able to get it from, you know, country from Costa Rica. Let's just talk from Costa Rica to the United States to still be able to be transported onto the grocery, you know, onto the grocery shelf to be able to get it right at the point where you want. So you, it's attractive to you and so you can buy it. If 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 edu if there wasn't education and there wasn't new technology and new information about that, then by the time that you go to select that, it could already be over you know overripe or not a, not enough. And so that's where a lot of the the, the the food waste comes in, and and it's a it's a key point uh, that that you bring up because uh, food waste is 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 not sustainable, and we have to be able to control that. Well, I'm 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 glad you addressed that. You know, thinking about my my business and personal relationship with groups like the St. Louis Area Food Bank. Are you aware of programs and, and could you share maybe some of that about how maybe the like food banks and different groups like that that are interested in feeding segments of the population that need that? Are there any programs that relate to maybe technology uh, or things like that, that that are actually improving the experience? You know, John, the only one I can think of is the one here in Kansas City, which is the harvesters or, or one like that, uh, to where, you know, a lot of the a lot of the food is taken to. I'm not familiar with with others outside of that one, um, but there but there is you know there is a lot and that are out there that that do that. Uh, you know, even to the point to where I know harvesters here it takes. Um, you know, if you've gone out and wild game hunt, I know they even take some of that some of that stuff. So I, I am not, I am not familiar with, with some of those. Now, because you're talking programs, yeah. sus sustainability educational programs by, I would probably say every, um, let, let's just say your, your, your crop protection businesses, your retail, your distributor, your equipment, mm -hmm. uh, your, a lot of your manufacturers today do have and are implementing sustainability educational programs within their own platform or within their own, um, uh, um, you know, it's a lot of it have it in their own missions and their own initiatives as goals um, to, to build good sustainable, you know, educational platforms. So, you know, everyone I think on the agricultural side is, is doing their part to make sure that it's understood and there's enough education around sustainability, not only for the grower, but for also for the consumer. 
you know, you uh, when you were talking about hunting, uh, that you reminded me of a story that if you would have said I was going to share this story before we started, I would have said um, probably not. But 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 you got me thinking about programs and about things. And so we talked about food waste and and, and we talked about different programs. So when I worked for the government, I, I was actually deployed to Anchorage, Alaska, and I'm teaching this class uh, in, in Homeland Security and some other stuff. Anyway, this this gentleman came up to me who was in my class on the break and he said, if I receive a phone call uh, from the sheriff, I have to leave. And I said, oh, is everything all right? He goes, yeah, I'm on the roadkill list. And I said, wait, what? He goes, I'm, I'm on the roadkill list. And I said, I don't understand. And he said, well, here in Alaska, so that we don't have food waste, if somebody hits a moose or some other animal, we get added to a list. And if we don't go and take care of the animal because we don't want food waste with, with us living here in Alaska, it's a $25,000 fine. And, and I was stunned by that because I had never heard that. And so in just, in just thinking about this conversation today, I'm sure there's lots of things, lots of programs and technology and things like that, that, that impact you know, uh, this conversation about sustainability. Right. Are there a couple different pieces of technology that, that you could share with us that relate? Um, you know, let, so let's, let's talk, um, technology. Yeah, there, there is, and, and I'm trying to think of one here. And, and I think that, um, that's specific to what we do. Um, so at, at Ag Authority, um, we've tested, or we probably have worked, John, with over 411 different technologies. Mm. Uh, with over about 275 plus different companies, whether they're major companies already commercializing or whether they're startup companies. And one of the things that, that we realized is that we did a lot of small plot demonstration work. Mm -hmm. So in the last two years, we've developed a large scale um, uh, platform to actually test some of this innovation before it goes into commercialization. So what this does in brief, what, what, what this platform does that we offer, it takes spatial and, and, uh, and aerial data mm -hmm. and it combines it all to be able to tell the grower or, or show the grower where that new technology can actually be placed or where it can be applied. So is it low pH, high pH? Is it better being applied in high yielding areas, low yielding areas? So that's a tech, an internal technology that, that we have developed to help de-risk not only the, 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 the company, the, the innovative company, but also to help the grower understand um, of where some of this is, is, to, is to be applied. Another one that comes to mind is, is in technology, you know, new technology would be, you know, spot and spray. Um, now you have some of your manufa equipment manufacturing companies that are coming up with equipment that they're just, I, I don't know the, the, the technical of, of how basically put together what is doing, but it's basically running across your field. It's taking a, you know, it's capturing an uh, a unwanted weed and then when it captures that, and then it sprays that weed right then and there. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've, part of sustainability, what we've done is we, we're not spraying the entire field. And uh, we're actually, you know, growers driving down the field and, and, and spot spraying and, 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 and taking care of that, that, that problem um, on a need basis. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully those two examples have kind of helped you on some of the uh, some of the, the technology that's that's there. Yeah, well, I'm I'm thinking about you know NGA, uh, you know obviously GIS and 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 other data, um, you know, and I and I think that's very valuable because you literally have a bird's eye view of your of your growing area and things like that. I'm curious, is is lidar ever used in in sustainability from from your experience? Not for mine, John. I am not familiar with that. Okay, um, and so you know. So this kind of returned back to, 
you know, how sustainability impacts, you know, companies or, or, or businesses, you know, I'm, I'm curious, like you've, you've touched on this a little bit, but I just, I just want to focus specifically on that right now. So how does sustainability impact companies or businesses and, and what, and what are some of those goals in, in reaching, you know, that, that place? So a goal, how does it impact companies and businesses? Um, I mean, sustainability improves the quality of lives. I mean, it protects our ecosystem and preserves our natural resources for, you know, for future generations. Um, I, I think in the corporate world, uh, sustainability is probably associated with, you know, organizations' uh, holistic approach. And they're taking into account, you know, everything from manufacturing to customer service in the end. I think a goal, a goal that we should, the companies should have, that we should all have, I'm thinking of a goal between a business and the consumer. I think there needs to be balance uh, between the, the company and, and, and the consumer. Balance in a fact that the consumer needs to understand how much a farmer can do. And I think the farmer needs to understand the consumer's needs, you know, but if we both meet together, I think this goes back to sustainability as a team effort. We, we, we all have to do our part. Um, and, and, and it, you know, if we do that, then I think it's a win-win for both the business and, and, and the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, impact, I think, depending on the industry, has has different has different levels of uh, variable. I'll, I'll give you a good example, and I think I'm, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier or not. But you know, buildings are nice, and they're they they go up, and and, and they're beautiful, and parks you know go up. And it, I want to say, and I don't remember the stat, but I want to say that a grower a grower is losing. I want to say that it's three acres an hour, three acres a day. He's losing a sustainable amount of farmable land a year to concrete, to, to just buildings going up. So good for the business, good for the, uh, you know, for let's just call it the urban business, not good for, not good for agriculture, you, you know. So I think it has, it's different. Uh, I think it, it's, you know, it's, it, there just has to be a balance not saying one's right or one's wrong. It's just there has to be a balance and there has to be some limits. Well, when you talk about that stat regarding concrete, whatever the that, that specific number is, you know, I'm, I'm curious about vertical farming. But before I ask that, or the question I want to ask, uh, this, is a, this is for everybody that's joining us. If you have a specific question, now is the time to go to chat, go ahead and collect or select everyone, excuse me, and just write the question. If you don't want everyone to see it before I ask it, just go ahead and select me. Uh, and then I am now looking at the chat and you'll see me now do this the, the rest of the time. I am paying attention. I'm just looking at the chat. Um, so go ahead and do that. Now, if you if you wanna come on screen, we are more than welcome to, to have you. We've just seen that people are more apt to participate if, if they go to the chat. So uh, I invite you to do that now because I'm sure that your questions far expand uh, mine in, in many ways. And I, I think it'd be a great contribution. So talking about the, 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 the losing the three acres a day or, or three hours, whatever that is, you know, there's this whole idea of vertical farming. And, and there's this whole idea that, you know, if we remove the farming from the land, we remove the weather you know, component, we remove the bug component, we remove a whole slew of things. How does uh, vertical farming uh, relate to sustainability from your perspective? Oh, so I want to, uh, it's again, sustainability is about feeding a growing population globally. Mm -hmm. Uh, I use the analogy of the ox and the guy, and you know the farmer, and and trying to to, to farm not sustainable uh, for feed the global population. Vertical farming, I I think it's it's great. I think it has its markets. I think it has its 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 customer. I think it has its consumer. Mm. It's um it's it's sustainable. Um, however, it it's not 
it's a new technology. It's a, it's a, but it's not going to feed a growing population. And I think they're also, and this is a, my own perspective, it's, they're limited on what crops or what commodities they can grow in vertical farming. I mean, take, 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 for example, just a watermelon. I mean, trying to, trying to grow that vertically. I, I mean, so it's not, it has its it has its its place and it's it's very efficient it's very sustainable it just it, it's not it 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 becomes part of helping feed the world mm-hmm. and meeting the consumer's needs and wants mm-hmm. yeah i think I, I think that's a great point because that 20 pound watermelon on the eighth floor of the vertical farm i mean that could be a problem right 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 that's it um, More than a problem, I tell you. Exactly. All right, going over to the chat, uh, Julian Wood, she asks, uh, when it comes to sustainability, how much responsibility falls on the consumer and how much falls on the brand slash corporation? Thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, I, again, there has to be a balance. So I think a lot of it does fall on the consumer. And it, it, I would say it goes back to the consumer just to understand and really be a part of, of trying to learn what sustainability means. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, and how it's practiced and how it's really nothing new and it's, it's been continued, it's been going on forever. It's just more, more discussed now and it's more, it, it's, you hear it more, you, you hear it in, 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 in everybody's in all corporate advertisements or corporate, you know, initiatives, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're both accountable. And I think the word here is accountability. I think both, and let's just, just say the grower and, and even our business, you know, we're accountable again for, as ag authority, for the, you know, developing good innovative technology. You know, that's what we're trying to do. New technology that will help sustainability, help feed the world. But the consumer is also understanding, needs to understand that, you know, number one, it doesn't happen overnight. And number two, um, you know, they have to understand what needs we're trying to to accomplish. Um, bottom line, it's, it's, it's a balance. It's a balance. And it, it's really hard. I, I have, it's hard for me to say one has, has, more responsibility than the other. We have to work together, and it, ha- it has to be a it has to be a team effort. Mm-hmm. So, uh, kind of bouncing off of Julian's question, you know, in thinking about if we wanted to do our own research, like I'm 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 the kind of guy, and I'm not flexing, but I read like 55 books a year minimum, and so I'm always looking for more information because that that obviously helps me in in conversations I'm having. Where where would you direct people to 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 resources? So really understanding what sustainability is and, and how we can all, you know, contribute individually. Yeah. So, you know, resources, I, you know, it's so easy and I, and I wish I could, I wish this would work, you know, as I was thinking through this and uh, as you think through sustainability, it's always, it'd be nice for you to have coffee with a grower. You know, um, have 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 a soda pop with a grower. Uh, just get to meet one that 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 can actually uh, explain to you and show you. You know, we learn we learn by doing or learn by seeing. And, you know, it's it's always I do better when I can see things and picture things versus having to read fifty five books a year. Yeah, you know, um, but it. I mean, some of the resources your your tech, your your extension services mm-hmm. are are good resource company or re, good resource uh, locations. And you know, again, every state will have an extension service, university extension service. Usually, for example, in Kansas, it's K State University. In Missouri, it'd be the University of Missouri mm-hmm. uh, that has an extension program. Um, you know, your um, uh, um, I just went went blank on 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 my other the universities just in in general the universities so those are probably going to be the best um, uh, areas to go look for resources. I mean, there's there's probably several books out there that you can read on sustainability. I mean, 
1907 book was, I'd be interesting to go back and, and really study and read that one as well. Uh, but yeah, there's, you know, chemical, I mean, some of your basic suppliers, those that are developing new programs, mm -hmm. um, have some good educational material on, on, on sustainability and what they're doing to, to, to help with, with the cause. Got it. Okay. And then, and then before my next question, again, this is to remind everybody, seriously, if you've got a question, we've got 20 minutes remaining. Uh, would love to hear your contribution. Like I said, either send it to everyone in the chat or you can select me and then uh, we'll go from there. So, uh, Tony, the, you know, I shared with you that I live rurally. And for me, you know, I, I, I grew up uh, in a rural environment. And for me, I always felt a connection to the rhythms of nature, which is a conversation nowadays that really isn't had, given that the majority of our population lives in cities. And so, you know, we're, we're in the rhythms of the city, not in, in the rhythms of nature for that matter. But how do you find having people really get present to more than just the seasons, but like how long, like for example, how long it takes a carrot to grow versus how long it takes, you know, a tomato to really to, 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 to grow. How, how do you find that, you know, understanding nature, like really truly like capital N nature contributes to this whole conversation of sustainability from the farm to the table? And nature, it does contribute and, and it contributes greatly. And I, and I you know, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting point, John, is because, you know, part of sustainability, I think I mentioned earlier with the bananas and, you know, the, the grower understanding, you know, when he has to harvest. So, you know, it's harvested green because if that lot or that trailer is going from Costa Rica to, you know, to, to Europe or going from Costa Rica to California, you know, it's then he needs to understand how long that time it takes for uh, for that product to, to transport and cross and do everything. So, so that that is key in, in my point of of the consumer understanding, um, um, you know, nature and, and and the fact that it really, you know, nature's diverse as well. So there was just a just as an example. Here in, in Kansas, uh, John, what earlier last week, the middle of last week, there was a thousand cattle, a thousand head of cattle that died uh, mm. due to heat. Mm. Um, and it wasn't that they've never have been out in the heat, but the night temperatures uh, were not were not were not getting cooler like they usually do. Mm. So the heat continued into the night, and you know you had a thousand head of cattle. Now, when you look at the overall production of, of, of cattle and, and how much is being used, you know, there's not an effect on the meat supply, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it's, a, it's, a bad, it's a bad thing for, you know, the Kansas feedlot that, that had it. But, you know, nature, again, um, had an effect on, on our production. So, so, so what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that Sometimes as consumers, when we see that we don't have something available, the majority of the time, and this is a guess on my part, the majority of the time, it has to do with nature and what nature has done to avoid us from getting that, that to, the, uh, to, to the marketplace. Now, that also drives consumer prices up when you have that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with inflation that we're living at today, you know, the question is, and, and you know, I, asking myself the question, you know, what effect does that have or will it have any effect on what the grower is doing on sustainability? Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, he, he needs to produce, but he also needs to be profitable to be able to, main, to maintain and stay um, uh, ahead of the curve. So you got me thinking with the story of the thousand head of cattle that unfortunately passed away, it had me thinking about uh, some things that I've been reading about um, you know, growers actually adding uh, solar panels to certain parts of their field and allowing some of their animals to be able to be in the same fields that, that have the sun panels so that they have natural shade. Because clearly, as we've cleared land here in the United States and around the world for that matter, 
you know, we've created a lot of places where there is no refuge from the sun. And so when we are in a heat wave and, and you can't lower the temperature of the animals overnight, you're going to have what happened. How are you seeing other technologies like, you know, solar and, and, and other examples really beginning to, to, to play very well with the growing experience? You know, I... I don't have a lot of experience on that, but what I can what I can say, and, and you know, this was you're right. Some of the things that you're seeing to be able to provide more shade, you know, to have cattle uh, in open pastures and, and graze, and you know, dairy cattle situations and things like that. Not I'm not very up to speed on on the livestock side of it, but you know, even even in 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 the livestock, it's been more of a concern in the livestock industry, I think, than, than anywhere else. You know, some of the technologies, um, again, that you're seeing out there today, um, one of the ones that, that, that comes to mind is, um, you know, there is a, there's a particular company that's not even in the ag field that we're doing some techno innovative technology work with that is is allowing for water for water retention mm. uh in the soil for you know just it, it, again it's not even ag associated mm -hmm. um so they're using what they have left over because they feel there is some water retention in that so if we're able to use that into the soil or you know as as a water retention do we are we able to eliminate the, the amount of irrigation uh, that, that we're currently doing and retaining more water for that plant uh, at the time. So not, I don't have a lot of examples or a lot of, um, um, you know, I re to your question, some of the technologies that are out there where, you know, some of this is happening in the livestock industry. I, I, I'm not very keen on that. So to, to signal, which is my next question, I'll tell you a story about what I'm doing, which is that what can we do individually to, to sustainability. And I was doing a little research. And so just, just for context, I live halfway up one of the first knobs of the Missouri Plateau. So, you know, here in St. Louis, if you go about 35 miles west, it's the beginning of the Ozark Plateau that obviously mm -hmm. extends across, you know, southern Missouri and then into Arkansas. And because, you know, these knobs, hills have been around for, you know, 100,000 years, maybe more, you know, you've got a lot of erosion uh, on the soil. And, and so, you know, we're in the, in the basins around rivers, obviously you don't see that as much, or you haven't seen that as much in the last, you know, 50 years, which we're beginning to see. But what's interesting is that I was doing research on, you know, the way that grass used to be grown and, and, and that clover used to be mixed in with grass so that you would have water retention. But then the seed companies one day said, no, Clover's a weed. You can't have that. And and so every year now I'm out there, you know, with, with, with you know, with, uh, with my hose trying to save my grass. And I'm like, I got to do some research, as I was talking about earlier. Yeah. And yeah. so and so in, in the fall, I'm going to be adding clover to my grass because that's going to help me have water retention. So that's something that I'm doing, which I assert is sustainability, because clearly, if you continue to, to let your soil, you know, erode, you're going to end up not being able to grow any grass, which right. obviously right. is kind of the crux of the conversation. So right. kind of looking with our few minutes remaining, what are some things that we can do individually more than what you've already said? So what are some things? Um, so let me let me take back. And I think earlier I mentioned uh, that I was heavily involved in 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 4-H growing up as a young kid. Yeah. Um, really, I I would tell everyone that that's kind of where uh, a lot of my love for continuing agriculture came, and that's what got me to be a county agent at first mm -hmm. for for the first two years. Uh, they had a motto. And it was to make the best better. Mm. Um, and you know, this is the motto that uh, that a lot of the youth today that are involved in 4-H are are being taught um, through educational programs that are you know brought through the University of the Extension Service and, and and things like that. So, you know, I I would say that what I would like to leave everyone with is the fact that you know you have to continue to educate yourself 
on what is actually out there and, and, and what is what what is, what is happening how how are things changing um, how we how are we adapting to it and and I, I think my number one goal would be for everybody to understand that we all have to be accountable um, it's not sustainability is only about the grower and I'll go eat all that I want and I'm done. So it comes into play for everyone. Mm -hmm. But I did find something that I said, and I'm glad you asked the question, that, that this question, because I, I did go in and I looked at something. I, I, I know we're getting here to the end. I, I'd like to share. So and, and this one was plant the tree. And then I, I asked myself, why? And there's actually 10 things that, that contribute to planting a tree. And, and I just want, because I actually had this down, I just want to read the, the top five. And it's, the first one is a tree is an oxygen provider. And one day's worth of oxygen for a family of four is provided by a single tree. Hmm. Number two, there, it's a money saver. Properly placed trees cover in urban areas can save cities millions of dollars annually in stormwater management, air purification, and energy conservation costs. Number three, it's a power investor. Trees have the potential of eliminating the need of seven 100 megawatt power plants. Emission, emission combatter. If a tree absorbs one ton of carbon over its lifespan, it's likely to erase 11,000 miles of car emissions. Number five, it's an air purifier. Once acre, one acre of trees has the ability to remove up to five tons of carbon dioxide and up to 13 tons of other particles and gases annually. So I won't read the other five, but I went ahead and tell you what they are. Well, we got to go, well, well, hang on, hang on. I, I do want you to read the other five because I know that all of us around the call are like, wait, there's five more. Well, the, so so I will have to give that. I'll have to follow up because I, I, I didn't. I, my oh, intention yeah, wasn't to read them all, so I didn't write them. Okay, okay, all right. So, natural coolant and, and, and natural coolant was about, I mean, it's a place to shade. I, mean, I can't read you. You know, you have trees and I mean, we all get under a shade tree, right? Yeah. And, and it provides natural coolant. Stress reducer uh, was, no, was number seven. Um, actually brought up less fighting here, which was, I thought was kind of interesting, but you know, the sway of trees and the sound of trees and things like that, it's, it's stress. It's an energy saver. Uh, stormwater filter um, what was, an, was the last one and a peacemaker. Um, yeah. So so those were the bottom five and, and I apologize, I didn't write exactly. No, you know what, no, it's, it's great. Listen, I, I, I think uh, you, you impromptu handled that fantastic, you know. Uh, this is going to sound weird, but listen, I don't mind hugging a tree from time to time, Tony. I, I have I have no problem with that. But yeah, let's let's give trees, you know, the credit that they deserve. So yeah. and, and I think the other thing that, that I had uh, that I would say would, you know, be accountable. Um, I think we're all recycling. Um, we're all trying to reduce food waste. And that's, you know, some of the things we talked about um, uh, earlier, um, you know, understanding what you know, what, what our role is in, in, in sustainability. I mean, volunteer, you know, just there's a lot of companies that have, you know, plant a tree programs or have out, you know, cleaning highways that, you know, reducing, reducing some of the, um, uh, some of the litter and things that we have there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that, that would be what, what I would say there's, and I think we're all as consumers doing, we're, we're, we're practicing sustainability you know, every day, we just, we just don't realize we're doing it. It's yeah. just now understanding more and, and making sure that it's a team effort, making sure that we're accountable where we need to be accountable. And don't, don't, uh, don't let someone else do it for you while you enjoy it. Right. You know, be part of, be part of it. Yeah. When, when, when you talk about planting a tree, uh, I was uh, at, at a, a nursery earlier in the year and, and all of a sudden I looked down and I, and I saw, the Chicago hardy fig. Now, a little secret about me, I love, I love fresh figs, right? I mean, I'll, I'll eat them, you know, like dried, but I love them when they're fresh. And, and I look down, I'm like, wait a minute, if this nursery in my area is selling this, then surely I can grow it, right? 
And yeah. so I, I bought it, I took it home and I, I started first in my little, you know, greenhouse, which, which is in my basement, started growing that there. And, and, and just, it's been exciting because I'm watching this tree that isn't necessarily natural to where I live. And then I just moved it outside yeah. a, couple, a couple of weeks ago and it's really starting to move. And what's exciting for me, and I think, I think this is what I got from your, for, from, the, from your intention to leave us with something is really you know, thinking about how more than just planting a tree, you know, you talked about seeds in the beginning about overseeding. And I think that in many ways, this is what these conversations, these smart talks powered by GenieCast are really all about. It really is about really talking to people that are smart about what it is that they're doing and that and that they're they're seeding and they're broadcasting and they're bringing, you know, the, making the world a better place through their particular lens or their particular, you know, slice of the world. And and uh, and I I personally have gotten a lot out of the conversation today. And uh, and by the way, hopefully in the springtime next year, I'll be able to send you some fresh figs if you're interested. Well, the bacon rab figs are, are favorites. So uh, yeah. So, right on. Anyway. Well, 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 I'm sorry, Tony. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. That's I. I really appreciate the opportunity. And and again, I I think we can all be smart. Um, you know, agriculture, production, agriculture, agriculture. I apologize. Is is I mean, it's our passion. Yeah. Uh, and we believe that everyone can embrace it. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what we want everyone to do. Perfect. Well, I would like to thank you, Tony Pardo, for joining us on today's Smart Talk, Sustainability from Farm to Table. Uh, Tony Pardo of AgriAuthority. Um, besides LinkedIn, can people reach out to you in, in different ways? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, at Tony.Pardo at AgriAuthority.com. And uh, that's P-A-R-D-O. Perfect. Not awesome. confused with P-R-A-D-O. <laughs> Well, Smart Talks are powered by GenieCast uh, with support from the Nitrous Effect and the Emerson Leadership Institute in the Shapet School of Business at St. Louis University, where their mission is higher purpose, greater good, through a focus on where mission meets the market. I'm John Lanius, and uh, we'll see you on the next Smart Talks powered by GenieCast. Learn more at GenieCast.com. And Tony, once again, thank you. And everybody, thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. Thank you.